Welcome to Planet Raconteur, where we who tell stories rule this world. I am Yuck Nasty, and I am your guide into our world that's filled with sights and sounds, both wonderful and frightening. Frightening. Filled with sights and sounds, both wonderful and frightening. Frightening. Dust to Dust by Benjamin McLean Max. It sounded like rain, fire, frying onions. It filled my head, summoning memories of the heady scent of rain caught on pine needles sinking into mossy loam, of embers sent glittering up into a starry night, the taste of onions caramelized in butter. It was none of these things, of course. The sound was coolant vaporizing against the outer layer of the crystal viewport piped at high pressure through a spider web of tiny capillaries in the crystal itself. The faint blue liquid flitted across the window every few seconds. It cooled the crystal, which would otherwise crack under the heat of the swollen star beyond. The star's moody, flickering surface filled my field of vision its greedy flames seeming to reach dangerously close. In fact, it was still at least 10,000 kilometers away. Even Bayaran ships couldn't safely get any closer. I had been staring at the mesmerizing patterns in its red-orange plasma surface for hours. My job was done. I had little else to do while we waited for the end. As if on cue, Kira trundled in. I smiled at her, and she looked back, her eyes widening slightly in acknowledgement. She stepped closer to the window and pressed a green-black hand to the cool crystal. Her ponderous head turned, and catching my eye, she jerked her hand back as if burned. I laughed, and her eyes crinkled slightly into her own approximation of the gesture. It was a joke she'd made several times in the weeks we'd been parked in orbit around the dying star. The Bayari were, in my experience, a melancholy species. The ancient telepathic race had no spoken language, no names, and no genders. They were a solitary folk, rarely found in groups larger than two or three. Most people struggled to work with them finding the silence oppressive, the solitude depressing. I, for one, had enjoyed my months with this particular Bayari, whom I'd named Kira and gendered female. Two small concessions to my unenlightened modes of thought she seemed not to mind. Behind her subtle, mouthless expressions and the slow, lumbering precision of her short, round body, I found a person of childlike exuberance and idiosyncratic humor, a friend of endless compassion and a mind of ancient, bone-deep sorrow. The Bayari were a contradictory people, but I fancied myself a contradictory person, too. We got along quite well. Kira, eyes still creased at her little joke, turned back to the window and stared pensively at the dark shape silhouetted against the fiery tempest. We call the planet Bayar. No one really knows what the Bayari call anything. It was their ancestral home world, their Earth. Three billion years ago, they lived among its verdant forests and along its shimmering coasts. I've seen pictures the planet had been beautiful. Now uninhabited for an eon, its atmosphere burned away, its teeming seas vaporized, its forests scorched to dust. Bayar orbited patiently, waiting to be devoured in the death throes of the star which had sustained it for nine billion years. 
I watched Kira's round, still form and tried to imagine what it would feel like to bear witness to the end of your home world. It was a far cry from the paradise it had once been, but upon those now barren shores, the first Bayaran ships had been built, the first Bayaran cities risen. Its moon, long lost, had been their first stepping stone into the cosmos. The relics of the civilization which left its atmosphere were lost to dust a billion years before Kira was born. I couldn't imagine how that would feel. I missed Earth, the pine forests and mountain rains of my childhood with a dull ache. If Kira felt anything similar while she looked down on the charred planet below, I saw no sign of that pain. We performed some final surveys, collected a few last samples, prepared to record for posterity the last moments of the planet's existence. When I finished the last calibration to Kira's satisfaction, the blasphemous fact of my presence had crashed over me at once. The Bayari were a solitary people. Only one had come to watch the death of their world. But I was here too. For whatever reason, Kira had brought me, so I too would bear witness. We stood in silence and waited. The end began on schedule. A flare of light as the planet's crust began to melt under the heat of the star. A network of glowing cracks spread across the planet's surface as heat and gravity tore it apart. The star flared again. Its atmosphere, roiling with molten rock and metal, fell to its core. Kira pressed a hand against the crystal, and almost instinctively, I did the same. As we watched in impotent silence, Bayar slipped into its sun and was gone from the universe forever. The irrevocability of the moment took my breath away. Nine billion years the planet had endured, nurturing trillions of lives, birthing an ancient space-faring people. It had existed for time beyond comprehension. And then, equally incomprehensibly, it was suddenly gone. When I finally turned away, I realized I was crying, almost shamefully. I met Kira's deep, subtle gaze. Her earlier humor was gone. She stared up at me from hooded eyes, fingers still pressed to the windshield. She held my gaze for a long moment, watching tears drip from my eyelids and trace their way along my cheeks. Then, deliberately, She reached out a stubby finger and pressed it lightly to my face. I stiffened, shocked by the unexpected intimacy. Kira withdrew her finger and studied the small orb of water which clung to her rough skin. She watched silent and expressionless until my tear dropped from her finger. Then she met my eyes and and inclined her head towards me in grateful acknowledgement of a pain shared. The End That was Dust to Dust by Benjamin McLean Max. This is episode four of the Planet Racket Tours season two podcast. If you are into our show, please do us a solid follow us on twitter subscribe on youtube and give us a like wherever you listen to planet rack and tour here is i found your cat playing new messages uh hi there Uh, i'm calling in regards to your missing cat uh good news i have your cat or rather uh what, what remains of your cat now now when i say what remains you're probably thinking that your cat is dead well not quite it's really a bit more complicated than all that you see um 
Parts of your cat are still alive and well. And that, that, that poses kind of, no, it poses a serious problem here, right? I got your number from one of the posters, uh, a missing cat, I think it said, uh, had a little uh, tags you tear off, but you put them up around the neighborhood, and I'm not going to lie. When I saw the $2,000 reward, that grabbed my attention. I, I figured, man, you, you must really love this cat, and that uh, there wasn't anything out of the ordinary about it, right? So I kept my eyes peeled. Then uh, the other morning, really, really early, I was walking down Robson Street, yeah? Now, this, this uh, stretch of the road has seen way, way better days, you know, uh, windows blacked out, old abandoned buildings, both sides of the street. Uh, not a road I, I should have been walking down, yeah? Now, I was by myself, and, and I kind of started to sweat and getting nervous. And I didn't see anybody. But, man, I swear, I, there were eyes from all directions staring at me. I was approaching this 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 dark, nasty alleyway. And then I heard a blood-curdling scream. Now, most nights, I steer clear of, of, of any kind of shouting or craziness, right? But when it emerges from the narrow crevices between abandoned buildings, usually I would walk as fast as I can and just hope and pray somebody else would deal with it. But this time was different. I felt like I was uh, uh, oogling a, a fresh, brand-new car wreck. And I just had to see what, what the distress of this other human being was. So I turned and I, I walked down this, this dumpster-lined back street, right? And I heard another shriek just before stumbling upon this terrified homeless man sitting on the ground. He was begging and pleading, Oh, please, leave me alone, leave me alone. His back was pressed up against a large metal dumpster. <clears throat> and his hands were covering his face. He shrunk like he was expecting somebody to hit him. He looked up at me as I approached, and I've never before seen this kind of a look of, well, you know, absolute horror on another man's face. It's quite frightening. Now, in front of him, about three feet away, was the, your cat. I saw your cat on the poster, yeah? Uh, one white and gray short-haired tabby. The cat you know and love she was cleaning herself licking her paws like a normal cat and it seemed obvious to me that the screams were, were uh, coming from this this homeless man yeah so uh, what i did was i hunkered down and i approached this both of them very cautiously a little bit of stealth you know what i mean i, I didn't want to scare the cat I felt like I was just inches away from my furry little lottery ticket worth two grand, and I wasn't going to take any chances. Quietly, I went down. Here, kitty, kitty, kitty. I made those kind of uh, sounds you, you make when you're calling your, your, your kitty cat. And as I drew closer, the homeless man turned to me and cried, Stay away, or this thing's going to kill both of us. Now, at the time, I, I guess that this man was probably high on something, yeah? And I thought it was, you know, just a cat. In hindsight, he was right. And, and well, I should have listened. But can you blame me? All evidence suggests that he was tripping on something, you know, that was rocking his world. Uh, now, I put my hands up in submission and, and told this dude, all right, man, I just, I just want the cat. I kept moving toward the, uh, your cat. And I was almost just inches away from, from grabbing the cat up and, 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 and taking it away when it just reared up and hissed at me and it just ran off in the alley. I swore a blue streak and, I, and said, well, there goes my two grand. Now I turned back to the homeless man and he was breathing a sigh of relief. Oh, you saved my life, brother. And he grew calm, and, 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 and he was surprisingly sober yeah, after the cat went away. I got to having a talk with him, and he says his name was Pete, and he'd lived in this uh, part of town for years, yeah? 
I asked him how one little cat could possibly scare a, a big man like himself, and he claimed that for the last couple of weeks, your white and gray short-haired tabby had been hunting him. Now, I raised a very, you know, no, this can't be happening style eyebrow to this dude and said, all right, Pete. Well, I'm not entirely convinced that you're being hunted. And here's what I'm going to do. If you help me catch this cat, we'll split the reward 50-50 and you'll be cat free. Now, this dude suddenly did something that surprised me, right? He shook his head, uh, and he said, No, sir, man, I ain't, I ain't, no way I'm getting close to that thing. He became really upset, man, when I suggested this. Like I was going to use him as bait to catch a lion. No worries, dude, I said. And I'm just trying to placate him as best I could. Offered him a couple of bucks before I left. And as I was getting ready to leave, I heard Pete shout something uh, behind my back. That cat's want, man, you got to listen to me. That cat wants my babies. But she's not going to get them. (sighs) The next day, okay, I got to thinking maybe your cat was slumming in the alley. I reckon that, that if I came back during the evening. I might find your cat prowling around again so that, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, my, here was my plan. I'm, I'm going to go back that night, and I'm going to go to the alley. And, and once I did, I found Pete, and he was laying on the ground right by the same dumpster. He was rocking back and forth, and he was just freaked out. He seemed to be cradling something, you know, holding it in his lap. I said, hey, Pete, what's going on? You okay? He glared up at me with, with pain in his eyes. That goddamn cat took my hands, he cried, and he held up his arms in front of him and presented, well, um, two stumps. The wounds looked fresh, and and the weird thing here, man, is, is they appeared to be carterized. I, I said, Pete, what the hell happened to you? I just saw you a day ago. And that damn cat, she came after me right after you left. Uh, he, he went on and excited and rambling and, and, and about how the cat had been scheming to harvest his body parts. I didn't believe him. No way a cat could do this. Not in a million years, right? Cats chase birds and throw around catnip pillows. You know, they certainly don't have the, 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 the wherewithal. To, to, to do like impromptu surgery in a dark alley uh, on, on a homeless dude. I told him, all right, Pete, sorry about that. I, I don't know what else I could have told him. Clearly, he was a victim of some recent bodily tragedy as far as I could see. But there wasn't much I could do for him. Maybe I'd give him some of the reward money I, when I found the cat. So, listen, I asked Pete, uh, you seen where the cat went, man? He aimed a stump toward me, and he looked at it and pointed the the stump at the building right behind me and up. Yeah? I couldn't really see. It was really hard to, to, it was because it was dark, right? It was getting dark, and there were a lot of shadows on the wall. But nevertheless, as I looked up, I swear I saw your cat hanging onto the wall with two fresh human hands in front instead of furry little cute kitty paws I made kind of a desperate here kitty kitty uh, but it wasn't to any avail and and, and the cat just disappeared on the roof I I went to talk to Pete and I told him he needed to go to the hospital Pete shook his head hell no Uh uh-uh that cat's waiting for me to let my guard down and show up at a hospital emergency room and he's going to finish the job he started He's going to take my precious seed. I looked up at the the, the building. It's an impossible structure. Cats can't climb uh, brick walls. I gave Pete another two bucks, and, and, and I booked, man. I had to leave the alley. All right. Now, by the third night, I, I came up with a plan that I thought was absolutely flawless but uh, 
I mean, you know, best laid plans of mice and men, yeah? This time I came to the alley, and I was prepared. I, I got this old cat carrier. I had a little bag of those little kitty treats that all the cats love. And, and I had my secret weapon, a cucumber. Now, this is how the plan was supposed to work. I was going to find out where the cat was hiding, plant the cucumber beside it. Then I was going to lure the cat out with a handful of treats. Now, now, hopefully the cat would exit the shelter, uh, start nibbling at the treats. I, I, I'd approach the cat stealthily, yeah, causing her to take off towards the cucumber. Uh, and then she's going to fling herself into the air, and I'm going to take this opportunity to catch her and, and, and deposit her in the, in the cat carrier. Now, I thought this was a really super impressive plan, and I felt really good about it, yeah? And I also convinced myself that there was no way the cat had human hands. That's that, that that crap's impossible, right? Now, what I thought I saw was all in my mind. I just it was dark, you know. And 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 I, what I think I thought I saw, I didn't see, or did I? I? At the time, I didn't know, but I was willing to set all that aside. Now, I mean, yeah, the sudden absence of you know that homeless dude, Pete's hands. Now, that was kind of mysterious, but. You know, I, I had uh, two grand on my mind, if you know what I'm saying. Now, so I'm there in the alley, and then I found what remained of Pete. I, I saw this this crumpled up pile of clothes in front of the dumpster. I leaned over and and and, and, and I picked up Pete's jacket. It was damp and it was oozing something wet and nasty, and it kind of looked like you know the uh, viscera you'd see in those horror movies. I, I dropped it on the ground, <clears throat> and it wasn't like Pete just to leave his, his his favorite spot here in the alley. I remembered how desperate he was not to leave the protection of that particular dumpster. Now, I convinced myself that maybe he, he did go to the hospital, right? And and but I I didn't know what all this nastiness was. This 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 crap was really, and it stunk. By the way, it really stunk. So, all right, I got to get back on task here. <clears throat> I walked up and down the alley. Didn't see the cat. I remembered Pete said something about hearing the cat dragging stuff up on the roof. And the last time I saw the cat, she was heading up, well, the side of the building. Wow. Climbing towards the top. I reasoned that the cat must have had some kind of shelter or or, or, or found a place to... to, to you know, kitty cat crash up there uh, on the roof. I found the stair ladder uh, on the uh, the external fire escape, and I had the cat carrier, and I climbed up the, uh, the the four stories to the roof. Now the ladder was really awkward and shaky, uh, uh, very dangerous, in fact, with the cage in tow. But I managed to get uh, up there all the way on top of the building, and I didn't fall. On the roof, next to this old broken down uh, high volume AC unit, I found a cat nest that was made out of garbage. It was domed and resembled a four man tent. <laughs> Pretty damn good for a kitty cat, right? It was made of a mishmash of couch cushions, old clothes, old newspapers, and on the side there was a gash. Like it, it was like a tent opening. And as I drew closer, I heard something moving inside this thing. It was time to enact my plan. I put the cat carrier on the ground, opened up the door, and, and placed a handful of treats in the cat carrier. I, I took the cucumber out, and I placed it right there by the entrance uh, of the uh, cat shelter. I heard a low rumble from inside as the cat started to come out. Now, over the course of these three days, the cat had undergone what I would have to call a profound transformation. And now I could barely recognize what this cat was, if it was even still a cat. I was, in, I was paralyzed by what I saw coming out of this, this, this shelter. It was monstrous. First, it, 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 when I saw it, it, it stuck its head out. 
and its gray and white fur was falling off in patches. And I could see the, 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 the bear, uh, witness to, to, and it was like, I don't, this is, uh, porcupine like quills coming out of its brow. The, the already large cat eyes must have grown to three or four times their original size, and they bulged out of that kitty cat skull like an exotic tree frog. Uh, then there were the teeth, just row after row of these jagged teeth all over this gigantic, horrible, uh, monstrous mouth. And, and she glared at me with, with what I could only call desperation and hunger in those horrible eyes. Then she slowly unhinged her jaw. You heard what I said, right? She slowly unhinged her jaw, causing her to resemble like a, a, a Cheshire shark. All in all, what this cat was now was about the size of a full-grown lion. No longer the cute little uh, kitty cat, house cat, you know, gray and white tabby. This was the cat from hell. She started uh, moving towards me. And when she placed her first paw forward, I realized there was still one further horror that I, I, I was going to witness. Holy shit, this cat has human hands. I, I, I jumped back in terror. This was, this was terrifying. I was expecting a cat. Not some uh, nightmare from a monster movie. The cat got closer and closer. And I got it. I understood that I was no longer the hunter. Now this cat was hunting me. Lines of drool just dripped off these needle-sharp teeth, right? And I was certain that this cat was now a hell spawn that was going to eat me and drag me back to hell. Then from down along the street, a car blasted its horn. The cat, now nearly a foot away from my head, turned to look toward the source of the sound. She saw the cucumber, and the effect was immediate. She, she shrieked an ear-piecing banshee, ah, howl, and she jumped so high, and she flung herself all the way off the roof. Moments later, I heard a loud, just like crash in the alley below. Yeah? I ran to the ledge and looked down. It was hard to see, but it looked like the cat had broken into lots and lots of smaller pieces. I was overjoyed that my life was saved and I wasn't in any more danger, but at the time, it, my, it was my, I was disappointed that, you know, because despite my best efforts, I wasn't, I wasn't going to see that $2,000, Yeah. Then I heard a chorus of, of these concerned mewing coming from the cat's nest. Now, I, I, I turned back and I went to the cat shelter, that little garbage hovel I just described a minute ago, and I found, check this out, a dozen kittens, all of them covered in short gray and white fur. At first, they like, looked like, hey, look, adorable kittens, yeah? Then I took a closer look. And I was shocked to find that each body of the cat, well, had the unmistakable face of Pete, our friend from the alley, the homeless dude. I watched these deformed, demonic kittens squirm and writhe, and they were hideous little abominations. But, I mean, they're little kittens, so I just couldn't leave them up there, right? I got to do the right thing. So I put the little kittens in the cat carrier, and I gingerly made my way back down the alley. You know, once I got to ground level now, here's what I find. Here's all the remains of your cat, all broken up. <clears throat> now, I assume this, this uh, broken apart monstrosity of a kitty cat was dead. Instead, each and every broken segment of your cat seemed to be in its own weird way alive with some freaky uh, kind of internal energy. The tail was just, just, just winding around like a snake. And I saw these two weird long cat legs dragging themselves away with the human hands. At last, I found the cat head, your cat's head, propped up against Pete's favorite dumpster. 
she was making this terrible, pathetic meowing noise, and it just broke my heart. I found this old uh, thrown away cardboard box, and I put your cat's head inside the box. <clears throat> so here's the deal. I'm back home now. And by the way, your cat's head has escaped from the box. Scaring the shit out of my grandkids. It looks as though a, a dozen or so of these chitinous, spider-like, weird legs have grown out of your cat's neck. And the damn thing's now crawling all around my apartment. It's climbing up the walls and it's making noises and scaring the hell out of everybody in the house. And to make matters worse, all the kittens are starting to shriek. They're starting to sound like Pete did when I first met him in that alley. It's a horrible sound. And I don't know how much longer I can endure it. So I'm going to sum this up for you right now. And I'm going to get right to the point. I think I earned that $2,000, okay? Please call me back so we can discuss the reward money. I can be reached at 555 34 Well, there you go. Another trip to Planet Raconteur. On behalf of myself and our other two fine raconteurs, Papa Dave and Bobby Anthem, we would like to thank you for listening. All of the stories presented on Planet Raconteur are used by permission or are in the public domain. Check out the show notes for the details on the authors, their websites, and their other releases. Hey, much love, and thanks again for visiting the Planet Raconteur.